As violence, conflict, and bad blood between various foreign nations, Native Americans, and settlers erupted on the western frontier, so did the coordinated battles between each side. Some of the most famous wars and the battles that came between them occurred in the American West, such as the Texas Revolution, the Battle of the Little Bighorn, and Red Cloud's War, just to name a few. However, beyond these massive conflicts and battlefields covered in bloodshed were much smaller conflicts that cannot fit within modern day textbooks. The truth of the matter was, there were so many miniature wars and unsettled tensions that it would take thousands of pages of text to try and summarize every single conflict that existed on the frontier. Thus, to make sense of these smaller struggles and uncover the fascinating events that led to such chaos, here is the first in a series of essays analyzing the battles of the Wild West you probably haven't heard of. The roots of the Great Raid of 1840 run deeper into the history of Texas and its relationship with the Comanche tribe of Native Americans. The catalyst for the conflict came early in the year in question, on March 19, 1840, and was a bloodshed-filled battle in and of itself. Historians refer to it as the Council House Fight. On the day in question, 33 chiefs of various Comanche bands arrived in San Antonio, part of what was then referred to as the Republic of Texas, and not an official member of the United States. The Republic of Texas had arranged a peace conference with these 33 chiefs, offering a trade in white hostages for a halt to the infighting between settlers and Native Americans. While the Comanche chiefs only brought with them a single hostage, which just so happened to be the 16-year-old Matilda Lockhart, the Republic of Texas held up nothing from their end of the bargain. This was even after the Comanche chiefs informed Texans the other hostages were held by outside bands of Comanche, and would be returned only after the additional trades were promised. Instead of continuing the peace conference or firing up further trade talks, Texas officials rounded up all 33 chiefs, along with their 32 members of their respective families, and imprisoned them without notice. Of course, the Comanches wanted no part of this and attempted to argue and fight back against the Republic of Texas. However, by this point, it was too late. After one of the members of the Comanche fired an arrow at a Texan whose gun was drawn, total chaos broke out. Once the dust settled, a total of 35 Comanche were killed, including two of the women and three of the children. Only seven of the Texans were killed, and they took in the surviving 29 Comanches against their will. The following day, a single Comanche woman was released back to her tribe's campsite, where she relayed the message that the rest of the Comanche prisoners would be freed if and when the Texan prisoners were freed. The update also came with the news of the council house fight that claimed the lives of 35 Comanche and revealed the disloyalty the Republic of Texas had shown. As a result, the warriors returned to San Antonio with hopes of fighting back against the Texans. But the Texans wouldn't fight, and asked for the Comanches to observe the 12-day truce they had just installed. The Comanches, feeling another backstabbing was imminent, held up no such truce, and instead killed the remaining 16 hostages they held from the Texans, angry and spiteful that their side of the peace treaty was deliberately ignored. They felt the Texans couldn't and shouldn't get away with such sabotage. Eventually, Word of the Council House fight and its violent reflection of the Republic of Texas reached Buffalo Hump, the first principal war chief of the Penateca Band of Comanche. Buffalo Hump, like many of his fellow Comanche tribesmen, felt the Council House fight was the ultimate betrayal and the last straw of his and his tribe's complacency with Texas officials. Over the next couple of months, Buffalo Hump traveled across most of southern Comanche lands to fellow Penateca campsites. There, he spoke with the second and third war chiefs, Yellow Wolf and Santa Ana, respectively. Together, the three war chiefs decided the most appropriate course of action was enacting revenge on the Republic of Texas and those who gave the Comanche the cold shoulder. 
Buffalo Hump himself was the first to suggest forming a raiding party and descending upon all of the Texas settlements between San Antonio and Bastrop, serious about making their wrath and displeasure known to all who wronged them. By July of 1840, the raiding party was all but finalized. They had amassed over 400 warriors committed to taking on raids, as well as an additional 500 women and boys to help maintain their traveling camps and do the work that the men would otherwise handle. Not only that, but the war chief's raiding party was diverse, and that they included lots of members from various Comanche divisions, in addition to the different bands and family groups represented by the warriors. Starting on the plains of West Texas, Buffalo Hump and Company began their ride towards the far side of the future Lone Star State, where populated settlements sat in the dark, ignorant to the troubles that would soon come knocking at their door. After a couple of weeks trekking into Central Texas, the Comanche raiding party led by Buffalo Hump, Yellow Wolf, and Santa Ana arrived at the outskirts of Victoria, Texas on August 6, 1840. At the time, Victoria was less than 20 years old, after being founded in 1824 in honor of the first president of the Republic of Mexico. There were only a few hundred people living in Victoria at the time, and none of them expected any sort of attack as the dog days of summer arrived. Unfortunately for the folks of Victoria, the lack of suspicion was warranted at the time. A few days before the Comanche's arrival, a few fellow rangers who had been scouting Central Texas were aware of a very large war party traversing through the open plains, their path heading straight for the smaller settlements of West Texas. As a result, the rangers held back a day or two and started shadowing the Comanche's raiding party, making sure the Native Americans couldn't detect them and protect the unassuming citizens for as long as they could. What the rangers didn't prepare for was the breaking of the raiding party into two groups. The first group remained at the camp with the women and children, while the second larger group, composed only of a few hundred mounted warriors, rode off towards Victoria. At this point, the rangers hadn't made it to this town in question to warn the citizens of the raiding Comanche's presence, leaving them vulnerable. On the night of August 6th, this vulnerability was fully tested by the warriors. Within minutes of the Comanche's arrival in Victoria, all hell had broken loose in the streets. Most of the citizens locked themselves into their houses or storefronts, barricading the doors from any violent visitors. In the end, not all of Victoria's residents were able to avoid turmoil at the hands of the Comanche. Twelve citizens were killed before a barrage of rifles and other gunfire started to rain down on the raiding party. When the Comanche warriors noticed the shots were raining down from the second and third story buildings above, they rounded up the troops they had left and rode out of town as quickly as they had arrived. In the aftermath, the folks of Victoria, Texas were mostly spared of extreme damage to their settlement. The Comanches had originally planned to strike only coastal towns, as it was easier to loot horses and other valuables in these places where security wasn't as tight as it was in central Texas. The raid in Victoria was only as deadly as it was because of the surprise attack made by a fraction of the total Comanche raiding party. Had the Texas Rangers made it to town to alert the citizens of the impending raid, or had the Comanches stuck to their original route, the results would have looked much different. Nevertheless, the Comanches continued southeast in stride, refocusing back on coastal settlements along the Great Raid. The night of August 6th, Buffalo Hump and Company had his fellow warriors camp at Spring Creek, knowing their next target of nearby Linville was in their sights. The following morning, on August 7, 1840, Buffalo Hump led the party to Placido Creek near present-day Placido, Texas, where they would once again set up camp. This time, they selected an isolated stretch of the ranch formerly belonging to Placido Benavides. They were only 12 miles away from the town of Linville, and without the rangers to warn them of the dangers lurking ahead, the folks there had no idea what was coming. In the early morning hours of August 8th, the Comanches formed a circle around Linville, guaranteeing there would be no escape before the attack began. 
Linville was the second largest port city in all of Texas, but its size was of no hindrance to Buffalo Hump and his angry tribesmen. After the Comanches surrounded their target, the raids began. They immediately started looting a few stores before moving on to personal residences, where the Linville residents ran about attempting to flee before being killed. As the raiding continued, a few Linville citizens came together to form a defensive strategy. Knowing they didn't have the muscle or the artillery to fight back, the citizens knew their only chance at survival was to outlast the Comanches while they were distracted with the pillaging at hand. One of the citizens suggested they move the townspeople into the water right off the coast, where a few boats and a large schooner were out busy with the day's catch. The suggestion came after they realized the Comanches were Plains Indians and had no combat experience in substantial waters. After an agreement was made that setting up a rendezvous on the water was the only course of action, the rest of Linville's population was rounded up and put on the various boats dotting the bay. William G. Marshall, captain of the mid-sized schooner, also opened up his vessel to the escapees. His boat was anchored, but deep enough that it would be unreachable to the Comanches. After everyone made it to the boats, all Linville citizens could do was watch as the raiding party burned down the settlement. In between looting, some of the warriors would waltz out of the homes with the linens and top hats of the settlers, as well as tying fine cloth and bedding to the backs of their horses as it was dragged through the mud. In the end, Linville only dealt with three casualties amidst the chaos. One such victim was the customs officer in Linville, named Hugh Watts. Watts was one of the many who had been ushered to the bay after the attack, but waited until the last second to return home so that he might secure the fairly heirloom he left behind. As he grabbed the gold watch from his bedroom, he was killed by the Comanches, who also kidnapped his newly wed wife. The death count was almost four when everything was said and done, as Judge John Hayes of Linville put himself directly into harm's way that fateful afternoon. He had grown tired of watching his town burn at the hands of the Comanche and brought with him a gun as he ran back towards the shoreline and started screaming at the Comanche warriors standing guard at the beach. Legend has it that the judge was only spared because his antics were so exaggerated and cartoonish, and the Comanches thought he had simply lost his mind, letting him live out of pity. Regardless, it's a good thing they did, because the pistol Judge Hayes had grabbed was sans any ammunition. By late afternoon, the raiders had completed their looting and packed up everything they didn't burn or otherwise destroy. $300,000 worth of trade goods from New Orleans en route to Austin were either stolen or damaged, and most of what constituted Linville's downtown was razed to the ground. Within hours, the Comanche departed Ground Zero and rode off as the former residents of Linville looked over their livelihoods, sitting in smoking clumps across the land. The damage was so great, the town would never rebuild itself, and its residents were forced to displace around coastal and central Texas thereafter, mostly settling in Port Lavaca. In the three days following the sack of Linville, the Comanche raiding party set up camp to regather their numbers and adjust for the massive amounts of loot and other supplies taken from the previous two raids. Their biggest issue came in the form of mules, which were slower animals that forced the Comanches to change their war strategies. Normally, they would simply depart the battlefield or raid as fast as they could on horseback, simply outrunning their opponent. With hundreds of packed mules transporting hefty materials, this type of retreat was impossible, and the Comanche's movements were much more methodical moving forward. Of course, this didn't deter Buffalo Hump and company from pressing forward, and despite their newfound lethargy, the Comanches were determined to continue exacting revenge for betrayal by Texas officials in San Antonio. Luckily for the Republic of Texas, the slower progress made by the Comanches worked to the advantage of the rangers in pursuit. Even with the madness that had transpired in Linville, the rangers still couldn't make an attack against the Comanches due to their sheer size. Now that they weren't riding into Texas at breakneck speeds, however, the rangers could organize a more proper front. In the hours after Linville had fallen, every ranger company stationed in east and central Texas 
was summoned at the request of Matthew Caldwell and Ed Burleson. Along with the Rangers were countless volunteers and former military men, all armed and motivated to strike back against the Comanches and put an end to the raids. The newly organized Ranger Party and militias held the Comanches in view until they finally made contact on August 12th. The first shot was fired on the plains of Texas, right off the banks of Plum Creek. It was only 25 miles or so south of Austin, near the present-day city of Lockhart. Almost immediately, the battle turned into a running gunfight. The Comanches were already aware their pack mules could cause potential trouble, and the arrival of the Texas Rangers was all but confirmation. Thus, the Comanches turned their sights back southwest, attempting to flee to the Llano Estacado closer to Comancheria. In the process, they let most of their pack mules go, in addition to larger quantities of dried goods that couldn't be salvaged. The Comanche party also left behind larger items, such as mirrors and unnecessary ingestibles, such as liquor. After the fighting had ceased, over 100 horses and mules were recovered by the rangers, in addition to an undisclosed amount of silver bouillon first plundered in Linville. In the aftermath, the Republic of Texas claimed they had killed 87 members of the raiding party, yet only 12 bodies were recovered the rest most likely taken back to Comancheria by Buffalo Hump and Company. The Rangers only lost 11 soldiers, despite being outnumbered by at least 200 men. When the Comanche returned to their stomping ground, they had successfully raided over $500,000 worth of supplies and livestock from the Texans. However, they knew they wouldn't be able to repeat such a strike. The betrayal by the Republic still stung but their continued counter would have to wait until the smoke cleared from Plum Creek. Despite their large haul, the Texas Rangers gave up on chasing down the raiding party. Reportedly, they had only truly cared about the stolen silver bouillon and focused their efforts on returning a split of the silver back to the raid's victims and its rightful owners. In the years following the Great Raid of 1840, Buffalo Hump and Company would continue raiding white settlements all the way until 1856. The 1840 raid itself would also go down as the largest such event by any Native American tribe against white settlers in United States history. It was one of the few times a battle resulted in an indigenous victory and represents so perfectly the relationship between Comancheria and the Republic of Texas in the mid-19th century. <laughs>